Uh, Richard Martini joins us for the remainder of the show. He's the author of Flipside, a tourist's guide on how to navigate the afterlife, and it's a wonderful afterlife. Richard Martini is an award-winning American film director, producer, screenwriter, and freelance journalist. After the death of a soulmate and a dream of visiting them in the great beyond, Martini went on a literary quest to find out what the prevailing science and philosophical opinions on the afterlife are. He journeyed into Tibetan philosophy, made documentaries in Tibet and India, and eventually was introduced to the work of the Newton Institute, founded by renowned author and hypnotherapist Dr. Michael Newton. Tonight we'll talk about what we can expect, how do we navigate the afterlife with our guest. And uh, guest for, as I said, the next two hours, Richard Martini. Richard, welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much, Dave. I appreciate it. On a sad day like today, I'm I'm sorry for all the people of Minnesota and all the musicians worldwide who are mourning the great Prince. Yeah, it's 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 a very big loss. Um, boy, looking at your resume here, uh, award-winning American film director, producer, screenwriter, and freelance journalist. You're kind of a slacker. Do you ever do anything with your free time, or are you just? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's been, I was just looking over some of my old work today because sure. back in 1993. Um, a friend of mine who was the music editor at Billboard, Bruce Herring, said to me, you know, you're a film guy. Would you mind writing music reviews for Variety? I said, are you kidding me? And so I got a chance to review Prince back in 1993 at Universal Studios. Oh, what an amazing show. Just, you know, you just can't believe what the guy can do when he's on stage. It's everything. It's visuals and it's it's guitar work. It's Hendrix. It's and I think he went around the stage and played almost every instrument. Right. So you kind of, you kind of went, oh my god, you know what is this person? Who is he? Plus, I know. he was such an unusual cat, as we know. <laughs> um, my good friend Edna Gunderson, who wrote for USA Today, she was a music critic there. She interviewed him like, I think she said today, thirty five different times, which is a lot because he was so notoriously private. But she said that when when she went to interview him, he said, you know, no tape recordings and no written questions. So you had to improvise when you were with the guy. You know, that was kind of the way he lived his life. He loved that, you know, being on the edge of whatever it is you're going to do. And I, I bring him up because, look, it is something that I talk about quite a bit. And on a day like today, when somebody dies that we know, we feel like we know, you know, you try to make sense of it. Like some people will be talking about his age. You know, I know he wasn't that focused on his age, 57. And some people will talk about his method of dying. You know, was it, was it an illness or what got him? Was it a drug or what, what the heck? But I'm here to say none of that matters. <laughs> That's all just icing on the cake. When right. you start to do this research about, which is what I've been doing for the past, 10 years filming people under deep hypnosis, and then I've expanded that into interviewing people who've had near-death experiences and com comparing the two. Um, you know, people who've had a journey somewhere, and then to see if those stories match up, and I found that they do. They do match up, and I've filmed 30 people now under deep hypnosis, which is a four- to six-hour session. I've done five sessions myself, you know, I had to check it out, like, what? Why are these people saying the same thing about life's journey? And when you sort of, when you come at it from that angle, okay, what does the research say? What does the data say? And the data says that we choose our lifetimes. We choose who we're going to be. We do it for reasons of learning lessons and teaching lessons. But there's a fundamental difference than what you've heard about reincarnation in a religious sense at least according to these eyewitnesses. And that is that between lives, we have free will. We can say no. Like if our, our elders or guides come to us and say, we want you to be born in Minnesota, and you're going to be this incredible artist, and you're going to move people, you have the right to say no. I don't really want to do that. And then your guides sort of get together and say, no, 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 no. You're going to influence a lot of people. But here's the rub. You're only going to be there until you're about 57, 58, somewhere in there. So you won't have the full journey, but you will impact 
many more people. So are you up for that? You see? And that's, that's what the data shows, that people choose their lifetime, choose who they're going to be. All right, we, we need to take a break. We'll come back and we'll learn more about this and talk about hypnotherapy. What's it like to film these people having these experiences, these emotional breakthroughs, these openings, and how do they deal with the aftermath once this knowledge, once the, the fruit of knowledge has been eaten, what do we do with that information? We'll talk about that and so much more Author here on Darming Winning Filmmaker Richard Martini is here with us to explore startling new evidence for life after death via the life between lives. And uh, this is this is fascinating. You believe that's where we find our loved ones, soulmates, and our spiritual teachers. Uh, Walk me through, if you could, real quickly, your journey. What got you to the point of wanting to research and look into this aspect so heavily? Absolutely. I, you know, I was just a regular Joe, a filmmaker. I had written and or directed like eight theatrical features. You know, I had like a career in film. I mean, I still do. Um, but along the way, I made friends with this actress, Luana Anders. We were very close, lived together. And after she passed in 1996, she came to visit me. And I had that experience that a lot of people have, um, you know, where they felt like somebody was in the room. And it happened so many times that eventually there was a moment where she, it felt like she took me to where she exists. Because I was wrestling with this idea, like, if she didn't die, if she's somewhere in the universe, then where the heck is she? And so one day, um, I had an out-of-body experience. I'd had a few, like, in high school and college, you know, floating around the room kind of thing. I just dismissed it. Didn't think it was that big of a deal. But in this case, I felt her come into the room, yank me, and pull me out of my body and zip with me through deep space. It's the only way I can describe it. I, saw New I was in New York at the time. I saw it disappear below me. And then suddenly, I was traveling with her at this incredible rate of speed, and I was and suddenly I took a right turn with her, and we and we wound up going through this almost like a wormhole. That's what it felt like. I mean, I saw the movie Contact years later, and it was like, oh, that was it. And when I came through the other side, I was in, all I can say, another universe. It felt like I was in, I'd gone from this universe into some other one, because everything, instead of going, um, like, forward, was going left to right. Anyway, I, and I stopped and... There she was standing in front of me, and she had her eyes closed, and she opened her eyes. And in that moment, I understood her. She was telling me, you were wondering where I am. Well, here, here's where I am. And at that moment, some knucklehead honked his truck horn outside my New York window, like they do. But the weird thing was I came back the route I had taken before the guy got his hand off the horn. So when I startled up in bed, I thought, okay, that was really, you know, was I drinking something or what the heck was that? And that started me on this search. Um, and before she passed away, she used to say to me, I have this recurring dream. I'm in another dimension. I'm in a classroom where everyone's dressed in white and I'm learning something about spirituality. And I thought, okay, that's, that's got to be the morphine drip. You know, she was dying of cancer and they had her on morphine and stuff. But then when she passed, her best friend called me and said, I had a great dream. Luana was in the fourth dimension, she said, in a classroom, and everyone was dressed in white. And I, so I mentioned it to the hospice nurse who nearly fainted and said that was her recurring dream, a classroom hmm. in the afterlife. Okay, so that was beyond my capacity to think uh, about, and then you know, I thought, well, I could never get into that class, whatever that is. She had better credits than I did. But she had been a Buddhist, so I studied Buddhism. And I went to New York, and I spent some time with Robert Thurman, Uma's dad, and I traveled through Tibet with him, and I made a film for him. But ultimately, that, because Buddhism, if you're familiar with it, they believe that reincarnation is based on karma, not based on free will. So that wasn't my experience traveling to see her. It wasn't like I was some kind of wisp of smoke. It was me, you know, traveling. So I picked up a... Could I, could I ask you, though, real quickly, Richard, and, yeah. and understand, not trying to rain on, on your parade, but... No, not at all. But trying to grasp a different concept or an understanding of this. We know how the mind works, and we know that people in extreme situations uh, can shut down memories, can yeah. alter parameters of true memories so that they cover for things. Could it be that you had that experience and it was 
with all contained within your mind as a way of dealing with the grief of losing someone you loved and exactly. had exactly, and that right. would make the most sense. That would make sense unless there was data that showed the opposite. So doctors call that hypoxia. They believe that, like, when you lose your uh, oxygen, it goes to your brain. You suddenly create some kind of a hallucinatory experience. I'll, I'll, let me just finish that part of the story, though. Please. When I picked up Michael Newton's book. The first chapter was about a guy under deep hypnosis talking about a classroom in the afterlife where he saw everyone dressed in white. And I thought, okay, well, that's a signal for me to follow this path. So I started, I read all of Newton's work, and then I thought, you know what, a documentary, I can film people while they're under hypnosis. And if, here's the premise. If, one, if everyone's making it up, right, each person, you'd be able to see that on film. They'd be making up stories in the... And the hypnotherapist would be leaving them. Don't you think you were calling Cleopatra? You know, don't you remember being in the Titanic? Well, so I took my camera to Chicago where I filmed a conference with Michael Newton. They allowed me to come in with my camera, unfettered. And I was the skeptic because I thought, this can't be true. Everyone, see, he had 7,000 people under hypnosis say the same things about the journey of the afterlife. And by the way, Newton had been a skeptic, didn't believe in past life regression. It was during a session where someone spontaneously remembered a lifetime where he got killed in World War I. And as a result of that, Newton took that information, not believing him, and sent it off to the British War Office. And they confirmed that this guy had died in the Battle of the Somme in 1916, exactly as he described it. So Newton opened his practice to talking to do past life regression. And somewhere in the late 60s, a woman came in and said, Oh, I should have been really depressed. And she said, Oh, I see why I'm so depressed. I normally incarnate with these people, but I don't, I'm not with this lifetime. And Newton said, Wait a minute, who, what are you talking about? And she said, I can see them in your office. He said, Did this happen in the past? Is it happening in the future? She said, No, I see them right now. I can see them all. So at that point, Newton closed his public practice and for the next 30 years interviewed 7,000 people who said the same things about the afterlife. That's his books, Journey of Souls, Destiny of Souls, Life Between Lives. And I thought as a filmmaker, wait a second, if I could put a camera on this, I can show that people have to be making this up. Otherwise, it's data. So I started filming people under deep hypnosis, and I spent the first week in Chicago doing that at their conference. And then they said, why don't you try it? And so after a week of doing all these sessions, which are all on the flip side, the first book, transcripts, I said, okay, well, this is a George Plimpton moment. I, I should see for myself whether or not this is fake. And I'm a perfect subject because I, I'm, I don't think I can be hypnotized. I don't believe in past lives. And I have no you know, consciousness of it. So I will disprove this, and I will not allow myself to pretend. That's what I, that was my premise. And after four hours, I mean, we did a four-hour session, and after a couple hours, I had the exact same experience that everybody else did. So a previous lifetime of experiences that I couldn't, I'd never heard of, wasn't aware of, but then later on proved to be the case through in-depth research. I met, I went to the between lives realm where I met people who claimed to know things that I consciously didn't know and told me things that I was able to come back and verify. And so the consistency of those reports, so I, I brought that to the University of Virginia to a science panel uh, chaired by Dr. Bruce Grayson, who's the father of near-death research. And he said, you know, Rich, I'm sorry, but we don't, science doesn't consider hypnosis a valid scientific tool, just for the reason you mentioned. People could be making it up. I said, well, that's true, except you have 7,000 people across the planet, not all of whom went to see Dr. Newton, who have the same reports of seeing their soulmates, of seeing spirit guides, of seeing a library of souls, all these different roadblocks along the way. He said, well, yeah, I, I, but I don't know how we can study that. So I started studying near-death experiences, interviewing people who've had a near-death experience, and then by using hypnosis, I'm filming them under hypnosis, a hypnotherapist walks them into the past, they recall the event of their near-death experience. And near-death experiences is a scientific study, and it has been studied by science, you see? So there, there's consistency of reporting of near-death experiences, people seeing a light, people coming, you know, seeing a certain, having a feeling of unconditional love. So in my case, 
and I'm working on my new book, which uh, right now I think it's called Hacking the Afterlife. But that's the reason I'm calling it that is because I'm asking people on the flip side to answer questions I don't know the answer to. And I'm having really unusual results, which is I have a conversation with somebody. They're not under hypnosis. I'm not a hypnotherapist. I mean, I've filmed 30 of them, so I'm aware of the technique. And I just start to ask them while they're fully conscious, having a coffee. Now, is there anything in your mind that you want to talk about that maybe has some relevance to this? And so they'll say, well, I have a recurring dream. You know, I see a face. And I'll say, well, let's find out who the face is. And they look at me like, well, I can't. You know, it's a dream. I go, well, maybe. But maybe it's under the surface. And I'm telling you, I've done this maybe a dozen times now. What people say is so unbelievable because they're telling, they tell people who've never done hypnosis, never aren't familiar with Newton's work or even my work, start to tell me about a previous lifetime, which I can, you know, get some of the details on the Internet as they're talking as well as walking me into the between lives realm where I talk to their spirit guides or somebody who claims to be their spirit guides, and I ask them similar questions about their journey and past, and then I ask, so why are you showing this? Why are you showing this past lifetime to my friend here? Well, again, fully conscious, having coffee, Starbucks. You with me? Yeah. And so I go, so why are you sho- Why I'm asking the spirit guide. I'm, can I ask? Direct question, you know, why, why are you allowing this person to see this? And they, they, the answers have been so fascinating. In one case, a, um, a spirit guy, quote-unquote, said to show him that there's no action that you could commit that you can't recover from because he had witnessed something terrible that had happened in the previous lifetime that he was responsible for. But to show him, and when he said it, tears came in his eyes. So unusual. Just a couple of days ago, I was talking to a filmmaker, never been hypnotized, doesn't know what I'm talking about. I ask him the same questions, and he gets to a point where he's not only talking to a very tough spirit guide who is grilling me with questions. Why are you asking these questions? But his mother shows up. And, I, and, and he started to sob, and I thought, oh, my God, his mom must have just passed away. I mean, he's so connected to this event. But no, she had died 12 years ago. But she was right there under the surface. And what I always ask is, now, can you tell your loved one here some piece of information they don't know so that they can understand that this is not me making it up, it's not them making it up, but it's something... I'll give you an example. My dad passed away in 2004. Um, This is before I was doing this research. He woke me up. You know, you feel your father's hand on your shoulder, and he passed away that morning. Woke me up. I was like, Dad. And he said, I'm experiencing indescribable beauty. I'd never heard him say anything like it. And then he said, I need you to write something down. And I'm thinking, God, am I making this up? I don't know. But I wrote stuff down. I notes to my brother's. He said, tell your mother I'm here with mom and papa, his parents, brothers, sisters. And then he named like six people I've never heard of. I wrote their names down, first name, last name. And at the end, I said, so, Dad, why, why, are, you telling, why are you coming to me? Why are you telling me? He said, simply, because you can hear me. Now, I'm not a psychic, a medium, or any of that stuff. But in that moment, I'm, I was tuned to him, so... I wrote it down. The next day I said to my mom, you know, did you ever hear Dad say anything like indescribable beauty? She said, once. He was talking about something that was so beautiful. And then I said, well, who are these names? And she said, oh, those are all his friends who died in World War II. One was a turret gunner. One was his friend in grade school. They had all died fighting in the war. Names I'd never heard. People I've never met. But clearly, people she knew. You see? So the information that my dad gave me was new information. It wasn't for me. It wasn't for my benefit. It was for hers. To let her know he's still with her. To give that that, that validation. We need to take a yeah. quick break. Richard Martini, our guest, Martini, when we return to this evening, Radio. as we discuss a tourist's guide to navigating the afterlife. Um, we've got links up to our guest's website. You can find it at darknessradio.com under the guest tab. Um, you talk about the fact that there is 
uh, data that we can correlate from these experiences. Um, yeah. One of the things, though, that, that you mentioned was the fact that, uh, you know, these people do not seem to be faking. They're not seeking that information. Right. But, you, you, I mean, you're aware, I know this, right, that the brain can be tricked and, and it cannot always tell the difference between a real and a vividly imaginative experience. And, right. And, and I, you know, what I found is, because I've really studied this, I'm, I'm the same path as you, which is I'm, right. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, forge into religion here. I'm, I'm just trying to find out what the reality is. And so when I talk about data, I'm talking about eyewitness reports that at some point when you have them across the board, doesn't matter what religion they are, doesn't matter, matter what background they are, doesn't matter who asks the questions, you get the same results. By the way, Helen Wamba was a psychologist in New Jersey who wrote a couple of books about the same uh, phenomenon a decade before Michael Newton. So he's not the only person who's done this, and she did it in a more clinical fashion because she published her results in a scientific way where people talked about why they chose their lifetimes. So, but back to your question. So, you know, where, you know, how do I call this data? Because data is in a controlled condition place. And what I'm trying to say, and what I've been saying to scientists, you know, who listen to me, I mean, Gary Schwartz, Harvard PhD, wrote the intro to Flipside. Um, he was startled by this research because, as what he calls it, he says it's self science. You know, you, you examine something and then you started following it and then you filmed it. And ultimately, once you get consistent reporting, and science has two things of us, really. One is consistency and replicability. So in other words, no matter who it was, I take you, Dave, or Tim, and I bring you to a trained hypnotherapist. You don't know what the questions are going to be. And if you allow yourself to say what's coming to your mind, whatever the first thing has come to your mind, and and again, while people are having the experience, they do have this weird, because you're fully conscious. I don't know if you've ever done hypnosis. Have you, Dave? Uh, no, not in a... I, you know, I did it once session, as a stage yeah. uh, entertainment program, but I was not, uh, you know, I've never gone in for a regression or past or life. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but when I, it, and, and so it's a misnomer. You're never under when you do hypnosis with somebody who's properly trained. You're, you're fully conscious. All they're doing is relaxing you, and right. they say to you, let's Whatever comes up, let's just talk about it. And so, ultimately, this is what I've discovered in this research, is that they're not doing the driving. They're not saying, you know, let's, let's go back to when you were in the Roman era, or, you know, stuff like that. They let you drive. Where would you like to go? So, some of the questions are like this. They'll say, so what month did you arrive in your mother's womb? And you would think... The answer would be, who knows? You know, I have the faintest idea. But I myself answered the question, and then I filmed, like I said, 30 people, and they all answered the question. April, February, six months later, the reports are kind of pretty consistent that the human energy, whatever you want to call it, soul or energy, doesn't show up until after the fourth month. And people say the reason for that is because there's nothing to do. <laughs> it's like a fish. And and they describe the process of melding their energy from over there. And that's kind of what I've been focusing on. What's, what's over there like? One guy suggested, and it's a wonderful afterlife, like being in a rocket ship over there, time, space, flying at a full rate of speed, and you drop out of that rocket ship and you land in a Ferrari going 200 miles an hour. That's what it's like to go from the energy between lives to the energy of a fetus. He said, however, it's like, imagine dropping in the cockpit of a Ferrari and then looking around like, are all the switches on? Let me check all that. Some of them don't work. So it's like you, you make a plan for what your life is going to be, but because time is not set, nothing is in stone. You're improvising. So when you show up, you pick somebody that you kind of know they're going to have this kind of persona and this kind of feeling and this kind of person, and, you know, maybe they're going to be a musician. Maybe they're going to be a filmmaker. Maybe they're going to be do radio. They're going to move people in a different way. You kind of know that that's the path and the journey. That's what you're aiming for, but eh, you can screw it up any, anywhere along the way, and people do, as we know. We know loved ones who are, like, on the path going right toward where they're going, and they get disrupted. You know, they take the wrong drug or 
you know, they step in front of a bus. I mean, it, it may have been planned that way. It's possible. But what I've learned is you just have to take the element of judgment out of the picture when someone dies. The only way to know why they died is to ask them or to ask somebody in their soul group who would know, who's known them for all their lifetimes. And I've done that. I've had that experience where someone's under hypnosis and I pass a note to the hypnotherapist and say, so ask them, why, why did you check out early? And the answers are really unusual. Sometimes they'll say, I had to get back because we're planning a next lifetime where we all want to be together at the same time. And I was already late and they've been waiting for me. Sometimes people say, oh, I screwed up, man. I forgot. I forgot that there was a whole third act that had worked out in advance, and I was just so depressed about being there. I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. But here's what they say. It's all forgiven back there because you're with your troop of actors. You're with your band of musicians. And if you had a bad performance, you fell off the stage. When you get backstage, everybody goes, dude, it's okay. Okay, calm down. You're fine. You apparently beat yourself up more about your mistakes than anybody else does. This is what people report consistently. You remember the movie Foxcatcher? Right. You know, about the athlete. And, well, when I first came across that story, there's an obituary, which you can find online. It was written by his father, uh, the, the kid who died, Dave Schultz. His father, Philip told the story for the eulogy. He said, when my son was five, he came to me and said, Dad, can I tell you a secret? And Philip said, yeah, sure. He said, um, Dad, I was standing in front of a council of 12 people, and, and we decided that I would come here to teach a lesson in love, but I won't be here very long. His father forgot about that conversation until his son died. And realized his son was aware of his journey, at age five, of what... So you can look that up. I mean, it's literally taken out of Philip's mouth. They didn't put it in the movie because it doesn't fit the paradigm of the way storytelling goes. But ultimately, the son knew he wasn't going to be here very long. He didn't, wasn't aware of how it was going to happen or when or etc. And as I said, you know, if my kid came to me and said that, I would be so freaked out I'd never let him out of the house. Right. You're not leaving. But... You know, if you if you get a chance to look at the book flip side, you'll see there's a chapter in there about my own family, my own stories of people coming to me and telling me about previous lifetimes that they remember. I'm not going to talk about it right now because it's actually, you know, so we stop that. Don't tell our stories because, you know, but it when you read it, you'll see. Uh, it really is very powerful testimony. And, you know, I would uh, tell your listeners to sort of, just suspend judgment for a second. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you get a chance, go to a hospice, talk to a hospice worker, and just ask the simple question. Have any of your clients ever sort of seen other people in the room before they pass away? 70%, according to, uh, there's a great talk called, Is, is Consciousness Produced by the Brain? Um, that was done by the doctor at University of Virginia, Bruce Grayson where he talks about 70% of the cases, Alzheimer's cases, in England, in the NEH, the hospice workers report that just prior to passing away, their clients, either minutes, hours, or days before they die, suddenly regain all their memory. They look around the room, and they go, oh, Pete, you're here, this is great. Or they start to see people who aren't in the room. Oh, Mom's here. <laughs> She's come for me. Mom, hold on. I'll get there. And what they do is after these people pass away, they do an autopsy, and there's no reason their brain should have been working at that time because their brain had shut down. There's no oxygen going to the brain in the parts of the brain where the memory is. But something happens, and so what they surmise is that the shields that are up or the filters that are put in place, mm -hmm. you know, like a, like a stereo receiver has tons of filters on it, you know, low-pass filter, high-pass filter, those filters keep out unwanted sound, right? But that unwanted sound may contain information, just the way you know bees can see ultraviolet light. That's information we can't see, but when our filters are down, and by the way, how else can you screw up with filters? You can have a near-death experience. You can take 
LSD or hallucinogenic drugs that screw the filters up. And like you said earlier, you know, how do we know that these are not just imaginary imaginings? And the way to know that is to is to report them. Because once you report them, once you get to see, they line up with a consistency that can't be anything else but data. People reporting that when they die, they f- go through a, a light or get close to a light that has an incredible amount of unconditional love attached to it. And I've asked people to describe that. What does that mean? What's unconditional love as opposed to conditional love? Well, let, well we know, have to I'm, take a break, Richard. We'll talk a little bit more about that right for after the remainder this. of the show as we talk about navigating the afterlife. When you put yourself into that and you're facing your own mortality or immortality and you're visiting past lives and seeing into those lives, how detailed, how aesthetic is it? I mean, can you feel, can you smell, can you hear what's going on when you're revisiting those moments in those past lives? Well, I can tell you it's different for everybody. In the people I've interviewed who have near-death experiences, sometimes they have a feeling, a sensation. Sometimes it's very visual. Sometimes it's very tactile. They feel things. They can touch things. They feel mud, etc., etc. In my own case, I didn't think I could be hypnotized, and I was convinced that I was not going to say anything. The guy kept saying, "What do you see?" And I kept saying, "Nothing." You know, and I was going. I was determined to do that for four hours. But took that because I was not going to be led, or I wasn't going to make up something unless I saw it. But he's a very adept, Jimmy Quas out of Maryland, very adept hypnotherapist. He said, well, just look down, Rich. What do you see? And in that moment, I saw my feet in a creek, and I could feel the cold water. So it was pretty tactile. But I saw that they were cut up, you know, like they're bleeding. He said, so what are you wearing? And I, and in the moment he said that, it was like a conscious pullback, you know, like in a movie. I pulled back, and I saw a guy standing, uh, probably not too far from the Twin Cities, a guy standing in buckskin with long black hair. And I laughed, because consciously I went, oh, come on, really? That's who you're going to make up that you are? You're an American Indian? Please. You know, I saw dancers as well. Why would you make that up? But I've been asked to just say whatever comes to my mind. And so I said, well, I'm wearing buckskin. I've got long hair. I'm, I'm a Lakota Sioux. He said, oh, what do you do with Lakota? I said, well, I'm a medicine man. <laughs> Consciously, I'm laughing. Like, really? He said, what's your name? I said, um, it sounds like Tatanka. No, not Tatanka. Watanka. And then, I, and then, of course, I said, dancers of the world, I know, you know, Tatanka means buffalo. I was thinking consciously, you idiot, you can't even make up the name you're supposed to have. <laughs> you got that wrong. So it's a weird argument, but anyway, and he says, now, can we go to your tribe? And I went, oh, no. And he said, why? And in that moment, I saw why. They had just been massacred. And so now I saw myself walking through this village. There are blood everywhere, you know, dead bodies everywhere, smoke. And then I went over to a teepee. I've never held a teepee. I've never touched a teepee in my life. But I felt it. The leather, you know, the skin of the animal. Opened it, and there was a woman lying on the ground with black hair, and there was a pool of blood around her. And I said, they've killed my wife and taken my son. And I said it with the emotion that that would, sentence would have on anybody. Easily the most painful thought I've ever had in this lifetime. And I thought to myself, God, if I'm making this up, why would I allow this? This is so awful, this feeling. But also, there was no boy there. There was just a woman lying dead. Why would I say my son? You know, but I felt it. Then afterwards, he said, well, who did this to you? And consciously, I was going to say, I thought, oh, you're going to say the blue coats, aren't you? Aren't you? <laughs> but I said, the frickin' Huron. And I went, consciously, Huron? They're in a state. New York, they're in Canada, and the Sioux are in Montana. What's the matter with you? You can't even get your... But anyway, and then about six months later, I'm just going to cut ahead. Six months later... Oh, I we got about a minute Claire, left in this segment, yep. I was in Eau Claire, Wisconsin with my cousin. I go, what have you been doing lately? He goes, I'm a historian for the Lakota. What? 
And I said, look, I had this weird experience. He said, well, just describe what were you wearing. I said, I was wearing buckskin. He said, oh, well, did you have feathers? I said, yeah. He said, how many? I said, two. It's over the up or down. I said, down. He said, that means you're a medicine man. Oh, I, why did I say my name? My name is Watanka. He said, well, Wakantanka means the great spirit. That's what they would have called you. I said, well, wait a minute. What about the Huron? He said, you're sitting in the spot where they fought for 60 years. Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Something I could never learn other than from a historian, because it's just not, it's hard to find. And I did find it. So it confirmed everything that I had seen, which I doubted, but eventually turned out to be true. So I had to allow that something happened, and I did see this guy. But then, of course, the journey went on. And we'll find out about that journey when we come back after the top of the hour. Richard Martini, our guest, it's a wonderful afterlife here on Darkness Radio. Good evening, welcome to the show. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. Along with me, Tim Dennis, this evening as we remember through music the legacy that is Prince. He will be missed. Our guest this evening, Richard Martini. We're talking about uh, his book, Flipside, A Tourist's Guide on How to Navigate the Afterlife. And it's a wonderful afterlife. In the last segment, uh, at the top of the hour, we were speaking about your experience and and what it was like for you, that even while you were having this experience, you were questioning yourself and questioning the reality of what this means. Right. How do you eventually come to terms and rectify that, uh, uh, you know what, this is exactly what it appeared to be? Well, I'll tell you. So, in, you know, just in terms of the timeline of, of my experience, now, as I said, I wasn't going to pretend that I was seeing anything, and yet here I was seeing things and feeling them, some visceral, you know, skipping around in terms of memory, but still, they were uh, exactly as other people had described in the sense of experiencing uh, something, a previous lifetime. So the hypnotherapist, in this technique, they'll usually go to the last day of that person's life, which we did. And then he said, where would you like to go? And I said, I want to go home. And when I said it, I thought, what am I saying? Do I mean Chicago, where I'm from? No, I meant home, not here, over there. By the way, I've filmed 30 people now, and they all say the same thing, roughly. No matter what their background is, they want to go home, which is not here. And by the way, Dave, you and I... Even if we grew up in the same house, we would have a different opinion of what home is. It's, we could say it's safety, it's security, unconditional love. Well, that's one of them. Whatever it is, we all have a different opinion, but we can agree that the word home to everyone means something about, you know, where they're comfortable. So, so I said I want to go home. And I had the experience of zipping through space and, and coming up upon a crowd of people whom I didn't recognize, Except one guy came out of the crowd, and I identified him as, oh, this is my spirit guide. I named the guy. And I'm saying it thinking, I don't recognize him, but, boy, he seems like a nice guy. And it's almost like we were old friends. And he's looking at me like, how you doing? <laughs> I'm like, I'm okay. And then he said, where do you want to go? I said, I think I need to go to the healing center. So I'm talking to a person that I'm seeing energetically, I'm not talking to the hypnotherapist. I'm just talking to him. You know, I'm saying, oh, let's go to the healing center. Then I say to the hypnotherapist, we're going to the healing center. And I see this kind of weird, almost like a Star Trek, a room with, like, lights. And I sort of sit down in a, in a chair, and I feel myself merging with the energy that's always back there. And what I've discovered in this research is what people say is about two-thirds of your energy, roughly, you know, depending, stays back there at all times, goes to classes, does stuff, hangs out with your friends. It does other stuff. About a third of the energy is here. Now, why is that? Well, they say, people say, that that if you brought all that energy, it would blow the circuits. They also say that people that are kind of famous in a religious sense or spiritual sense usually brought more energy because that's, you know, they're more connected to the flip side than the rest of us are. Let's just leave it at that. I'm there in some chair, feeling myself healing of this old age of an Indian where I had a lot of wounds and a lot of stuff happen to me. But I'm now feeling completely energized. And so the hypnotherapist says, where do you want to go? And I said, 
and my guide is saying, where do you want to go? And I go, let's go to a classroom. Remember, Luana talked about this classroom. So I'm, I find myself in a classroom, and I teach film up at Loyola. And I'm looking at the class. Like I've seen many classrooms, and all the students are looking at me like, oh, it's so exciting. The teacher's friend is here. And then I recognize this teacher, not from here, but over there. I'm like, oh, there's my friend. And then I describe her. I talk about this class, which is an energy construction. I talk about how that the memories that we carry from lifetime to lifetime travel with us, some kind of a fractal. And again, I, these are these are terms I've never used in my lifetime, but I'm saying them as if I'm conversant in this language. But my conscious mind is going, what, what, what? what? And then the spirit guy says, where do you want to go next? I said, I want to see Luana. Remember? That's my friend who told me about her classroom, and, you know, I wanted to see where she is. That gets interesting. So I'm in a classroom, which is more of an auditorium, and I see her sitting in the back row. She's about 20. I met her when she was in her 30s. So this was before I knew her, and she's young and pretty, and she's got a ponytail. And she looks at me like, what the, what are you doing here? I've appeared, you know, almost like a Star Trek episode, in this classroom. But I'm talking aloud. I'm saying to the hypnotherapist, I'm now entering the classroom, and it feels like an auditorium. And you know how that would be if somebody just appeared in your classroom? Everyone would freeze, which they all did. The teacher stopped. He looked at me like, what are you doing? The students turned around and looked at me irritated. You know, if I'm making this up, you'd think I'd have a different welcoming committee. You know, they're looking at me like, shut up. We're in class. And I say, this is a classroom in healing. These people help channel the healing light of the universe into doctors and healers here on Earth so that they can have effective outcome. And this kid, looking at me, says, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I thought, oh. And I said to the therapist, oh, I, I see, I've interrupted the class, and now they're chastising me. And then I say, well, look, people sign up for lifetimes. They don't always sign up to be healed. So not all doctors are going to heal everybody, and not all the patients are going to be healed, because you have to learn about the energy of illness so that you can teach that. And that sentence seemed to mollify this kid who turned around like, well, okay, I guess you do know what you're talking about. I'm telling you, as it happened, as it occurred, it was as weird as I'm saying it right now. Just strange. And I must add, two years later, I did another session with a different hypnotherapist just to see, you know, am I going to come up with some other weird lifestyle? Not only did I see another lifetime besides the American Indian, I also went back to that classroom. But it was only minutes later, and Luana was talking to the teacher, and she was saying, God, I'm so sorry my friend interrupted the class. Here he is. He has some questions for you. So here it was two years later, and it felt like 20 minutes later over there. I, I'll just leave that for what that is. Now, now it gets to why you chose to be Dave, why Prince chose to be Prince, why I chose to be Rich, why your listeners happened to tune in tonight, why this is important. Because I get in front of my council, uh, it's with Michael Newton's term, but there's like eight individuals I see in front of me, and they've, they're all very wise, and they kind of help you uh, examine your lifetime. How'd you do? So I'm in front of this you know, group, and they're asking me, so how'd you do and I brought a list of questions, which I never thought I would get this far, but I jotted down like five or six questions, one of which was, why did I choose Rich Martini? And I asked that question, and everyone laughs. My counsel all laughs, and they go, uh, they say this, every thought, action, word, or deed contains energy. So every time you paint a painting, sing a song, write a song, every time you help somebody, some of your energy goes into that act. Every time you write a poem, every time you read a book, you're reading some uh, quantum level energy of the author of that work, and you can heal people with that energy. And they said, and you chose to be Richard because you thought comedy and film would be a way of healing people because, as we all know, a guffaw in a theater will instantly change disposition no matter how ill you are. And they said, but tears work the same, however, they require catharsis. Now, as I said, catharsis, I've never used it in a sentence. You know, I'm trying to keep up with what I'm saying. It's so bizarre. But anyway, they said the reason that you chose Richard was because you felt you could heal people with film. 
And then I said, I just wish I had chosen somebody more successful at it. <laughs> and, the, and the council all laughed, and the hypnotherapist laughed as well. So it's the only time I've gotten a, a laugh from two planes at the same time. But ultimately, I felt like that was going to eventually change. And what I did was I took this research and these transcripts, and I took the film. I filming. I filmed like 30 people now, and I put it together, and I put it in a film called Flipside. I sold it to a guy on Universal, and they have it on their website. And you can find it online, Amazon.com, and I, you know, I think they charge like two bucks to watch it. But it's 90 minutes of excerpts of all of these sessions, including my own that show that people under hypnosis say consistently the same thing about the journey of souls. I know that sounds weird, but it's, it's trippy, but there it is. When you're given this ability to go and see and witness and even get the tactile feel of feeling your feet in the water, and you can choose at what point you go back to visit that life, if there is a consciousness and a glimmer within that being that you were, mm. have you ever tried to affect the outcome of that moment for them? Well, it's an interesting question. So just think of the construct in this way, which is over there, time exists. It's not what people say, according to what my research is. I mean, and there's a lot of people out in the world who say there's no time in the flip side. And that, you know, you have an immortal self. It's all immortal. Well, that's not what the research shows. We all are learning. We start somewhere. There's young souls, and then there's older souls. Okay? So it's a linear process. It's just much longer. I'll give you an example. A close friend of mine did a session, and she remembered being a, an English captain of a ship in 1610. And she gave enough details of where this guy lived to how he died that I could find him. I found him in the Old Bailey records of, of you know, ships and stuff like that back in the uh, East India Company. And she died at the age of 25. Pirates boarded the ship, killed her. She described that in great detail. And then when she went back to the Between Lines realm, she was a teacher in one of these classes. Completely different class than when I visited, but she was a teacher. And she, because we're close friends, later on we talked about it, and she said, you know, it's weird. It felt like that 25-year lifetime, like I had gone out for a cigarette. I said, what does that mean? She said, like, 10 minutes. So just as a just as a mathematical construct, let's just leave it as 10 minutes, okay, over there is 25 years here. So when you think of it from that angle, 100 years here is really like a 40-minute movie, you know, with commercial breaks. So when we talk about people who used to live on the planet 2,000 years ago, you're really talking about people that only lived like 20 movies ago. So if I said to you, ah, you know, remember, Dave, when you and I were in the Roman Legion together and you kept kicking me every time we went up that hill? And then, you know, let's say that you do remember that. But the thing is, it's not so odd that we would run into each other here on the planet. You've heard about quantum entanglement? Right. It's, it's where, you know, two photons, wherever you put them in the universe, they suddenly react. Right. Well, I found the same kind of reports from soul groups. The, and Newton saw that there were anywhere from 3 to 25 individuals in your soul group. And I, in a session, had a, had a uh, spirit guide describe the process of being assigned your soul group. Think of it as a classroom that you're in for a long time. Here, it might seem like 2,000 years. <laughs> That's a long class. Over there, it feels like 20 hours. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you're in this classroom, and each one in your soul group is learning kind of the same thing, maybe addiction. So you might say, well, let's, you know, I'm going to choose a lifetime where I'm going to conquer that. And you're going to play my alcoholic parent. And then you can say, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I did that in the Viking era. I hated it. And then I say, well, you were so good. You know, the only way I'm going to learn the lesson I want to sign up to learn is if you play that role. And, you know, your friends all weigh in and say, yeah, this would be great if you can play that role. And we all come down together. And hopefully we all meet up. It's an improv. You know, like I said, people can screw up. Time is not set. Everything's not laid out. You're on stage. And suddenly you go, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. I really don't want to play this role. And so you switch. 
you you know, you become a Buddhist. You come off be a, a monk. By the way, it screws everybody else up in the play who've all signed up that he would play that role, you see. But there's all forgiveness, because once you get back home, and everybody's back in the same room, and by the way, like I said, two-thirds of your energy is always back there. So you can actually be having a discussion with one of your pals, saying, what did that for? You're supposed to go to Italy with me. Why, why did you screw up there? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. But it's all forgiven. So, I, you know, the easiest construct for me to use, being a film guy, is it's a play. We're here doing a play. My wife hates that because it seems like it's a pejorative in some way. She prefers classroom because, you know, you learn lessons. If you fail, you can go back and take, take a lesson again. You know, the test, you can do the test again, and your friends will assist you. But I like the play part of it because, you know, somebody... You've seen someone die a hundred times with somebody in your soul group. A thousand times, whatever, whatever the number is. And they suddenly do something really bizarre, you know, and they're checking out. And and you're back home and you go, oh, my God, Mm -hmm. I didn't see that coming. That was brilliant. Because, of course, you're not gone. You're just not here. You stepped off stage. You've moved back where home is where everybody else is much more energetic, where people are much smarter. People are, are more, you know, like I say, the language is way elevated. The energetic patterns are way elevated, where there's things that you can do. I'll give you an example. Um, film producer worked on a lot of big blockbuster films. She said, Rich, you know, you're talking about this hypnosis stuff. I don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. However, I'm having an operation next week, and so... I'm going to try it because I heard that, you know, hypnosis might help me. So on the way, I drove her out to the session in Claremont. Mm-hmm. I work with Scott the Campbell, lightbetweenlives.com. And um, on the way there, I said, so do you have any questions for your counsel in case you get there? And she said, no, I'm not going to get there. I don't believe in it. I said, all right, well, let's just uh, yeah, have a couple of questions. So she's a total skeptic. So her questions were, is the universe a machine? Good skeptical question, right? Right. You know, is it all mapped out, right? Is it all, you know, mechanically set? Number two, which I kind of gave her, I said, you know, ask what the meaning of the shift is. People talk about the shift in consciousness. I'm sure you've heard it on your show many sure. times. The idea that, you know, the that the earth is shifting. What's that mean? What is that? And number three, she said, I want to ask what or who is God? <laughs> okay, that's a good one. I've never really ever asked that before. So now we get to the session, and she went into, first she went into a previous lifetime, which was hilarious, where she was like a, a cowboy who married some young girl. He was like older, and the young girl took him out riding in the buckboard and then told him to go to the river and get her some water and then drove away and left him there to die. So, you know, it's her last day, you know, that moment on Earth where, you know, experiencing that. And then, whatever, said, so now what happened? And she said, I, I just jumped out of the body. And I, it's like, I'm so, I always wanted to be a cranky old man, and I finally did it. She was like ecstatic about it. Very unusual reaction. Then when she gets to her, you know, between life arena, and she sees her soul group, they're in the midst of playing a game of, like, cosmic tag. I've never seen anything like this. Sign me up. Talking about it. Sorry? I said, sign me up. Cosmic tag. Yeah. I'm all about it. So, but, but here's the thing. So at first, my brain is going, cosmic tag. You know, that sounds kind of puerile. But she goes, no, no. The cosmic tag, you're invisible completely, and you have to find six individuals before you can win. And they can hide in any universe. <laughs> so talk about. So, you, so you're looking for an energetic pattern. You know the way Google searches for word clusters, right? That's what you have to do. You have to suddenly search for an energy cluster that's not visible. Anyway, so she described this thing. I was blown away. All right, so let's get to the three questions. Do we have time for those? Yeah, please. Okay, so first question, is the universe in a show? She gets to a, a spirit cat who's a little bit of a curmudgeon. Again, something else that was odd. 
his whole attitude was like, who are you people? Why are you asking me questions? I'm busy. Like, what do you want? And she found him in this library of souls that Newton calls it, but it's like, I see this description over and over again. Some people in the New Age world call it Akashic Records, which is a Sanskrit word, which means, you know, the history of the humanity, blah, blah, blah. I see it from a different angle, which is, it's a library. And that's what people describe, like the word home. You know, it's, it's different to each person who sees it. It's not the same library. Some people see monitors. Some people see holograms. Some people see microfiche. Some people see books. And you can take these books and open them up, and you can look up previous lives. So she gets there, and she's looking through these stacks, and she runs into this guide who's going to give her these answers. And he says, is the universe a machine? Yes, it is. However, it's sentient. <laughs> okay. So meaning that when you do something or learn something, that the universe learns it. I can't get my mind around it, but that's what he said. The second thing is... Is the Earth experiencing some kind of shift in consciousness? And he said, quote, Oh, you humans. I always love somebody who starts a sentence like that. Oh, you humans think that naming something, you can get a better handle on it. You know, shift in consciousness, it's no big deal. It's not like a, a cosmic thing. However, if you want to understand the shift in consciousness, imagine yourself a crab walking on the ocean floor, and you open your eyes and realize you're in an ocean. And in that moment, because I've been talking about how oxygen is like water, you know, instead of H2O, it's just O2. We breathe it, we exhale it, it behaves like water. We have to be in it, right, to survive. But we don't treat it like water. We treat it like we can pollute it. But here he was saying, you know, you're, you're conscious and conscious just to realize that you are in an ocean, you're in a different paradigm than you thought you were. Oh, that was clever. Okay, what about God? He said, God is beyond the capacity of the human brain to comprehend. It's just not physically possible, which I thought was interesting, almost like somebody saying it's too much input to put in a computer, or he's ducking the question. I couldn't tell. Then he said, however, you can experience God. And I thought, oh, wow, this is great. I had met a, a Bushman in Africa, a guy who had never seen a pool of water in his life. We were talking about it. We were sitting next to a pool. And I said, well, have you ever been swimming? He said, I've never been in a pool of water. So I was trying to describe it to him. You know, you can't. You can't describe water. Being in a pool, you, know, you float, you know, it's weird. It's, you're, you know, it's wet. You can't experience poolness, but you can jump in it. And once you experience it being in a pool, then you know it, right? So he said, you can't know God, but you can experience God. And the way to experience God is to open your heart to everyone and to all things. And at first I thought, well, that's a weird bumper sticker. But then I realized opening your heart to everyone, well, that's next to impossible. We're talking about unconditional love, mm -hmm. right? Conditional love. I love you except that you're pointing a gun at me or except that you're standing on my toe or, you know, you're not saying the stuff I want you to say. So opening your heart to everyone. Wow. Very few people on the planet can do that. But then beyond that, opening your heart to everything. So meaning your chair, your table, your whatever it has a right to exist. It's here for a reason. You, you might not be able to fathom what it is. That's okay. But it exists unto itself for a reason. Trees. You know, I started to look at trees now. You asked me, like, how this stuff has affected me. Somebody said, trees are lungs. But now I start to see trees as lungs. Of course, that's the opposite of what lungs are. You know, lungs, oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. It's the opposite. And they look like lungs. So you start to see the planet from this other perspective. And by the way, when I finished my session in Chicago that first time, I, you know, the skeptic, I walked out of there feeling like I had taken the red pill. That suddenly I saw the planet not for what I had been told the, you know, 57 years of my life at the time, but what it was. And it felt like it, the axis had shifted not hugely, but subtly. 
And from that point since then, you know, I've continued this research. I continue interviewing people under hypnosis. Friends of mine call me up and say, let's go out and see Scott and, you know, Claremont. And I go, okay, it's an e-ticket, man, you know, to get ready. Or I'm interviewing people, and they come from all over the world. People call me up. A guy from India called me up. I've had this recurring dream. It's really bothering me. I you know we're having coffee. I'm, well, let's talk about it. what's the dream. I see myself at the foot of Jesus, at, you know, at the crucifixion. Okay. <laughs> and the thing is, is I try not to judge what people are saying. I just try to ask questions. What? So what did you see? What was the story? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've become close friends. He's now publishing Flipside in India. But the whole idea is, is not to upset people's religion or to upset their way of life or, you know, or upset your mom. Or as I'm fond of saying, I'm the guy in the back of the theater who turns on the lights and goes, hey, everybody, it's a play. You're wearing props. These are costumes. Come on, guys. It's a play. Stop being so serious. And the audience, boo. <laughs> the actors are like, really? It was right in the middle of my soliloquy. Do we really need to talk now? You know, turn the lights off, Rich. We're trying to have a play here. I don't want to be the guy running around going, you know. However, I think it's important to note that when you start to examine that we might reincarnate, we might choose to come back here, then it makes sense to leave behind fresh water, fresh air, and fresh earth so that we can experience this wonderful, unbelievable planet the way we have in the past so that we can it'll still be here in the future. You see what I'm saying? Sure. That's why I, you know, I don't care if people are going, turn off the lights. I, I feel like, listen, and, the, and I've also found this. There's, there's somebody out there listening tonight besides me and you and Tim. That's the three of us. That's it. But there's somebody out there who's struggling, having a hard time because they've lost somebody close to them. Mm. Okay? I've experienced this many times. And what I'm trying to say is just open your heart to the possibility that they might still exist. You can't see them. You can't hear them. You, they aren't with you. You can't hold their hand. It's true. But try to tune yourself into them, almost like a receiver. And I think one way to do it, I've heard this, and it seems to work, is take a photograph of your loved one and picture it the moment you took the picture. Like really, in your mind's eye, meditate on where you were, what the sun felt like, what the noise in the room was. I mean, really recreate that moment. Really put them in three dimensions. And then ask them a question that you don't know the answer to. Ask your loved one something that you don't know the answer to. Right. And they may, you know, depending on how their tuning is, it could be busy. Really? Is that your question? Lottery numbers? Stop asking me for lottery numbers. Whatever it is. <laughs> If they can respond to you in some way, they will. And, you know, I just think that's a, that it's worth doing this research for because sure. it'll help somebody get back on the, you know, the bike. We need to take a break. Richard Martini will continue with us. Right Richard, after this. You, you, you've got somebody like, like a prince. You've got somebody like a Dave Schrader, like a Richard Martini, who, who you say get to choose this life. And then they get to jump the track if they want to, and they can screw up what they set forth for themselves and upset the apple cart for others. If that's true and we can jump the track and we can make these changes, why even bother having a soul contract to begin with? <laughs> well, think about it from the play perspective. So let's say you're in the middle of doing play 527 and you step off stage or you leave early because you've got a party to go to. I'm sorry, I can't do this performance. And you walk off stage Everybody on stage is like, but dude, you know, we all had things that we had to do. So I'll tell you what, let's do it again. But this time you do this. And what you find in, in the reports anyway, is that when people talk about when they screw up, they're the ones who feel terrible about it. Oh, I really, I'm so sorry that I didn't do that. But beyond that, let's take it a little further in terms of, how can a person sort of see their path and journey from the perspective of the flip side, you know, without being under hypnosis, casual conversation, right? So for example, I asked an FBI agent, when did you first know 
what was your first conscious thought that you were going to do the kind of work you do? And she said, preschool. I said, really? Preschool? How did you know that? She said, I kept lists on everybody and what they were doing, what they wore, what they took to school, you know, what what the, their assignments were. When you ask people that question, what was your first conscious thought? That's the first one. Like, what's your first memory? But then beyond that, what's the first conscious thought that you are going to be doing what it is you're doing? I mean, you find quite often, I'm sure you've seen it in many reports, like, I just knew it, you know. Oh, I kissed my husband. That's the other question I asked. So when did you know that your significant other was going to be that person? And people will say, sometimes they'll say, oh, I, have, I still don't know. You know, they've got five kids. But when you really examine it, the very day, the moment they were at a party, they started talking. I've done this dozens of times, and people will say something along the lines of, something about the way he looked at me and the sound of his voice made me feel like I was home, made me feel comfortable, even though I just met this guy, you know, in a bar or whatever. Even though those people may not stay together, for, but something... And what, what that points to is what people talk about under hypnosis, sometimes in a near-death experience. They talk about a life planning session where you're with your friends and you're working out, like, so how are we going to meet? And you may say, okay, when we meet, it's, it's going to be at this party. and It's going to be really noisy, but I'm going to look at you in the light and you're going to see my eyes. Remember the movie Heaven Can Wait? Warren Beatty looks right through the light and remembers her. So... There's other things that are, are notable that you can point to. For example, purple. You know, where did Prince come up with this idea that purple would be his color for his life? Well, it's not here to answer it, but I would guess that it happened a long time ago. So it probably started because, you know, I was looking at the first video he did in Minnesota, the first thing in 83, singing Purple Rain when they filmed it. And everybody had purple guitars. So what... What does the color purple have to do with the flip side? Well, Michael Newton discovered in his second book, after he had been doing this research for 30 years, before he wrote his first book, Journey of Souls, and then in his second book, he asked the question, well, if I could hold a mirror up to you, where you are over there, what would you look like? And he started getting these reports of colors. Well, I'm, I'm more yellowish than I am blue. You know, I'm more blue than I am this. And he started cataloging all those reports. So what he discovered was, in his research anyway, that younger souls, and this is not a pejorative, it's just everybody's equal on the flip side. They all treat each other equally. Nobody hoards the jelly beans, as one guy said. But younger souls respect older souls, and older souls respect younger souls. But younger souls have generally a lighter color, according to what they see, sort of white to yellow, yellow, and then it keeps going across the spectrum. And when you get to the darker blues, then you are like somebody who's been on the planet for a longer time or been in existence a longer time and has, you know, like graduated. And when you get to the purples, you get somebody who's, when someone reports that, the people that are in that darker color usually are like people that are on the planet. They're like monks. You'll, you'll find it in the research, I'm just saying. It's not that they sit down and go, I'd like to be a monk, and I'd like to be purple. That's not what I'm saying the opposite, which is when people talk to people who are on the flip side, and they say, well, what is your council of judges? What are they wearing? More often than not, they're wearing very dark blue, purple robes. When I first heard it, I was like, well, that, that sounds like a judge. You know, People are just extrapolating and making that up. Well, it's consistent. People just say it consistently. And then you can ask people, like, well, describe how the color, like, look carefully. And they'll say, well, it's like I can see, like, the waves of color moving back and forth. They they're, they sort of blend together to be this darker color, meaning every lifetime you learn, you learn something new. You learn, hopefully, you learn something powerful, and, and, and it helps you along the way. And when you ask people, so who's in your council? Each one of those people in their council, according to Newton's work, and I've done it myself, they'll say, oh, I earned that in a previous lifetime. I earned this music artist that's here, this judge, this not judge, the, this council member who represents that victory that I had about, about learning how to 
manipulate music and energy. And then I've asked people, so where is music in the universe? Where does it come from? And somebody said, it's aligned with healing. The healing arts of the universe, the healing light of the universe, is right next to where music comes from. David Bennett, he wrote a book called Voyage of Purpose. He was in um, the Morgan Freeman thing, the first episode of the Story of God. They interview him. I interview him for It's a Wonderful Afterlife, and I have that up on YouTube. But David Bennett tells me about how he had a near-death experience. He was a scientist working on a boat. In the near-death experience, he experienced that light, that beautiful, unconditional light of love. And at some point, he got to a place where he could hear this unbelievable music. So I asked him to describe it to me. You know, why was it unbelievable? Like, what, what were the tones? What did it feel like? So he was describing this energetic pattern, which is, of course, what is music? It's just energy. Another woman in a so wonderful afterlife. She well, said, hold tight, Richard. We've got to take our final break. We'll come back and find more of the stories right after this. As we wrap up this evening's program, Richard Martini, he is the author of Flipside, A Tourist's Guide on How to Navigate the Afterlife, and It's a Wonderful Afterlife. We were talking in that last segment of a few of the, uh, the tales from your uh, second book, It's a Wonderful Afterlife, and we had to interrupt you right before you got into another one, so please uh, take over from there again. Well, just really briefly, this, this woman who was a musician, uh, at some point she saw herself in an, on another planet, and she was talking about, and I don't know if it's a, you know, inner construct in her mind. I don't know if it's real, if it's in the universe. But she saw this crystal city. And she said, uh, and the hypnotherapist said, why don't you go check it out? So she goes down there and she sees like an amphitheater. And the most amazing music is coming out of it. And the hypnotherapist said, well, why don't you see if you can play there? And the next thing you know, she's experiencing that. They've just allowed her to step on the stage. Now, but, you know, of course, is she creating it? I don't know. Is it something that, you know, energetically you could figure out? I don't know. Are there other examples of crystal cities that people talk about? Yes, I've seen those before. Is it some place we can all go? I don't know. You know, is Prince hanging out with Jimi Hendrix right now and rocking? That's possible. That's possible. And But it's the people that you've met and you connected to and your soul group that you're most interested in hanging out with you see so in my case when i saw myself going back there the first person i went to after the indian life was my wife and my son i saw them i wasn't thinking oh i want to go see my wife and son but they were there and i embraced them and i thought oh this is so amazing you know i had not known who these people were half an hour earlier but now i was embracing them in this really powerful way but I've, you know, I've been with uh, George Nori a few times, about five now, I think. And I'm going to ask you the same question that I've asked George, Dave. Please. So, what was your first conscious thought that you would be doing what you're doing now? Well, you know, I, I guess that'd be hard to say. I, I was a child, and I used to listen to the radio, love radio, and I used to sit in the garage with my friend and our little black. Sony recorder and and we do <laughs> fake radio shows. So I I knew when I was see, seven wait. or eight. Nobody just does make radio shows when they're kids. Not everybody. I mean that is so cool. So to try to go back in your mind's eye to that first time that you did that. What what was the feeling you were having? Did it feel? What was it? What was the feeling? It was what I wanted to do. So. That's what I'm saying is that when you start to examine your life, not from this willy-nilly thing or that, that we're all robots, that uh, engrams will suddenly become sentient at a certain point, the evidence, the data shows that we're fully conscious before we come here and we're conscious while we're here. And children are conscious sometimes of their previous lifetimes up till about the age of seven. I've seen it myself. But we are conscious of who we were. And you just have to sort of open yourself up to it. Well, wait a minute. When was the first time that I met my significant other? You know, when I looked them in the eye and went, oh, shoot, I'm, I'm screwed. This is the person I'm going to be with. I mean, I've heard that. As, <laughs> I've had that happen well, twice. <laughs> one woman said to me, I felt nauseous. I was like, why? She said, because I knew I would never be with another man. I thought, God, that's so weird. How would you know that? My brother 
was talking, he met his wife in a, in a bar in Chicago and he said he was walking to the bar and he saw this light come down over her head and he actually went over and looked up at the ceiling. There was no light, but there she was a glow. You know, and of course he didn't think about that. He doesn't think about this stuff. Right. You know, it's not part of his world, right? But all I'm saying is just allow it to be part of your world because when you start to, like, you know, asking your loved ones questions that you don't know the answer to, when you start doing that, it's not you have to get the pyramid head on. <laughs> it's no, but it's to, once you open that door, once you open that that conduit to the possibilities, that's when you'll start to see the miracles happen. That's when you'll start to see the reflections exactly, of what's been exactly. and what's and what I'm What I'm saying is, there's no evidence of fear you know, in any of these cases. There's no evidence that some evil right. entity is going to come and inhabit you, even though people talk about that. That's just not in my data. Well, that's Richard, I, I appreciate your time with us this evening. Everybody go check out our website, darknessradio.com, under the guest tab for more information on our guests this evening. We'll be back again tomorrow night with you. And remember, tonight, above all, as you think about Prince and the loss, that the world is feeling. Be kind to one another, love one another, and give attention to those people around you because we only get one ride. Make the best of it.